that's new to me and uh, that's Zbigniew Brzezinski is a national security advisor, <laughs> and right. even he doesn't know how to spell his own name. Dude, you're right. <laughs> I mean, there may be four M's, a silent Q, uh, a, a, uh, a dryad fart, uh, you know, an end twig, and some hieroglyphics in there. And he is still, I mean, the number of people who've got silly names is legion, right? Yeah. So the question is, what, <clears throat> what, what, do, you, what, what do you think was the issue? If it wasn't well, the issue was a lack of connection with the appearance. I agree. I mean, I defooed from my mom before I even knew what defooing meant because I didn't see any substance in her. Uh, I didn't see any value in having her around. And uh, I still live with my dad and I'm, I'm just too hesitant to, to make the call and defoo again and go on my own. And, and I, I thought that the problem was this name thing, and my fear was always becoming uh, visible on social networks again because, you know, I could end up being cyberbullied if people found out that I changed my name. So even that was bothering me. But right. So it hasn't solved the problem, right? Yeah, it hasn't solved anything. Right, and and this is you know that this is the great illumination of the species is tied into the basic fact that there is no external problem there is no external solution to the problem of insecurity that was poetic no but it's it's true i mean uh, there is a huge amount of profit in the world by pretending to people that there is an external solution to the problem of insecurity if i lose this Wait, if I have this makeup, if I get this haircut, if I dye my hair, if I have abs, if I have a tan, if I have a car, if I have this amount of money, if I get hair transplants, if I get my teeth whitened, if I get this scar removed, if I get this mole removed, if I get a tummy tuck, if I get plastic surgery, if I get these contacts that make my eyes look like alien vampires, if I get my eyebrows to be thinner, if I get my nose hairs plucked, if I get a nose job, I could go on and on, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If there was a solution to the problem of insecurity, then life would make no sense if there was an external solution. You cannot buy or change or move or alter or pay your way into virtue, into self-acceptance, into truth. Truth is something you accept. It is not something that you buy, right? You're right. And the truth of the matter is that the problem was not your name. Please go on. It was a symptom, right? And changing, changing the name is changing the symptom, right? And when you change the symptom, it doesn't solve the problem, right? That's what people do. They, you know, oh, this girlfriend didn't work out. I'm going to date someone new and blah, 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 right? Like, so by the time people are in the third marriage, they finally figured out that they may have something to do with marriage failure. And then what they do is they... Look at themselves. Start to work on themselves, right? Yeah, yeah start to work on yourself, right? So that means I'm not working on myself because I'm... Oh, no, I didn't say you weren't working on yourself. I mean, no, you're listening well, to the show, you're calling yeah. it. I didn't say you weren't working on yourself. I, what I I'm saying is that the cause of your bullying was not primarily your name. That's a revelation to me. That is, I mean, I'm so, yeah, it is. It really is. Right. Now, seriously, um, if, if Brad Pitt had your name... <laughs> Right. And had his, you know, confidence and cool and all that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. His name would become cool. You're right. And, and people would be naming their kids after him. Right. <laughs> yeah. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Or as Gertrude Stein put it, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. <laughs> right. And cool by any other name is still cool and unattached by any name whatsoever remains vulnerable. Unattached to the parents remains vulnerable. Right.
So if it's not the name, what can you do, do you think? I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> That's why I knew it. That's why I wanted to get in there under the wire. Sharp son of a gun stuff. Let's see. Uh, I can confront my dad and sit and talk about this with him again and tell him that, you know, anytime I brought this up to you, you lectured me instead. Would Would that be valuable at all or... Well, I mean, I think that the only relationships that exist are based on truth. Everything else is just a mutual and isolating delusion. Yeah, and my relationship with my dad is it, its so superficial. And ever since I found your show, it's been waning. I mean, I just... Well, and I would urge you to, to as I do in general, when people aren't in sort of physical danger, I would urge you to, you know, sit down and really try and connect with your dad, which can be a long-term bumpy, sometimes frustrating path. But um, I do think that you should try to connect. I, I, I can't be satisfied on one-tenth rations of shitty food for my diet. You know, I'm a in or out kind of person. And mm -hmm. I can't, uh, you know, it's a mortality thing too. I guess I've always been pretty, pretty conscious of the old death train are coming down the tracks kind of thing, right? I mean, we're all tied to the tracks, so to speak, and the train is coming. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, with my family, I just, you know, after trying to, for months to, to connect with them, I'm, I just couldn't spend that time anymore. Another brunch, another Christmas, another Thanksgiving, another birthday party, another outing of not connecting, not talking, of making noises that sound like conversation, but are actually just a dry fencing of permanent erasure. Yes, if I know I have no shot at connecting with my dad, I mean, I'm, it seems like I'm sort of avoiding the whole thing. And uh, basically because I'm financially dependent on him for the most part. And Well, and I mean, that's obviously not inconsiderable, and right? you don't have to starve to death for the sake of truth. I mean, the the key thing is is to, as I said, truth is not something to be bought, but but to be accepted. And wherever we have doubt, we investigate further. That's a scientific method, right? We generally don't investigate whether gravity exists anymore. Yeah. But um, where we have doubt, we investigate further. Where we have certainty, we do not investigate further. Yeah, so I'm certain. And, that's, that's why. Well, so if you're certain, then then to accept that, I think, is important. Because once we accept the limitations of our relationships then we can move the bar higher, right? Move the right? bar like higher I, as in what? As in expect more from other relationships that okay. we have or could have in our life, right? Mm -hmm. Why do I keep telling people to raise the standard of their relationships? Because that's the only way that you're going to end up monogamous, right? Is you keep raising the bar in your relationships. That is the only way to remain monogamous because you have to keep expanding your relationships. You have to get used to keep expanding your relationships in your life. Something somebody said to me when I was a kid, they said, oh, you know, if you don't get married, you might date 10 or 20 people in your life. But if you get married and you work at it, you can date a thousand people in your life because you're, you and your partner will be continually changing. So we have to get used to my wife and I keep raising the bar in our relationships. We keep working on intimacy. We keep working on openness. And it's, it's a fantastic ride. Never a dull moment uh, and uh, always a delightful experience. It's, it's fun, right? It's fun and uh, it's continually growing and uh, it's rich. And so when people sort of say at, um, they stay at like 10 or 20% and they say, well, I can't push my relationship any further, you know, with, with, with siblings or, or with parents or whatever, then I know for a fact that they're never going to have a satisfying or long lasting marriage because you can't keep a marriage at 10 or 20%. Right? Yeah. And that's so dissatisfying. It's so, it's so dissatisfying. So I'm telling people because, look, I want families to be stable. I want parents to be there for their kids, right? And the best way to have marriages stable and keep people there for their kids to raise them in a positive and peaceful manner with enough resources so that the kids get what they need 
the way that you get that is to have people raise the standards of their relationships. And if they're stuck in family or family of origin relationships that are you know empty and and shallow and small talk and boring and so on, then you gotta you gotta tell people to raise it. And you raise that for the future kids. You raise that for the stability of the marriage to come. And if parents or siblings or whatever can't keep up, well, you know, for me, it was like, what the hell? Why would I sacrifice my relationship with my wife for the sake of people I never even chose to grow up with? Just won't do it. So this is why I think it's important to really work on continuing to raise the bar in your relationships. You keep raising the bar in your relationships and you see who can keep up. And you hope that people can keep up and you try and encourage them, of course, to keep up and so on, right? But it's sort of like if, if you want to win the Olympic gold, then, you know, you say you start training with some friend, right? And you, you, you're really good at it. And you, even your friend maybe is pretty good at it, whatever you're running or whatever. And you keep showing up and you're getting better and you're getting noticed and you're getting the best coaches and you're getting sponsors and all that kind of stuff, right? And your friend is like, you know, after a year, he's like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Forget it, right? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm just going to run recreationally. I was like, that's fine. That's fine. Fine. But then I'm still going to go for the gold, right? If you want to stop training, that doesn't mean I have to stop training. I'm still getting up at dawn and running an easy 10K to, to get ready for whatever it is I'm going to do, right? The fact that other people are willing to give up on excellence should in no way prevent you from pursuing excellence, now, they will try and tempt you with that, right? And, and this is as true in relationships as it, is, as it is in everything else, right? Freddie Mercury had a band when he was in boarding school in Zanzibar. I don't think those guys ever became professional musicians. Did he then say, well, you know, I'm not going to become a rock god because you guys aren't that ambitious? No. Go for the best. Go for the deepest. Go for the greatest connection. If other people don't want to keep up or don't care or don't care enough about themselves or are focused on the afterlife or are too frightened of anything that has any depth, fine, you know, stay there. But I was going to continue going into self-knowledge. I was going to go continue into connection with others. And if the people didn't want to keep up or didn't want to follow me on that, that's fine. But that doesn't mean that I have to reduce my ambitions because other people don't want something, right? That's like me saying to my wife, would you like a coffee? And she says, no. And then I say, well, I guess I don't either. It's like, <laughs> that doesn't make any, I'll go get myself a coffee, right? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm actually... And if you're willing to, sorry, and last thing is, if you're willing to accept low standards for relationships in your life, then you will always be vulnerable to exploitation because people won't be proactively loving you by watching your back, right? You're going into the armed combat of dealing with the nut jobs of the modern world without any cover, without any airstrikes, without anyone watching your back in radio silence with a rubber water pistol, right? When people really love you, they're constantly scanning the world around you for dangerous people and they're watching your back and you're watching their back and you're going through like a, a little huddle, like one of these, uh, uh, Roman phalanxes with their shields out. You're going through the huddle and getting to where you want to go. And people are watching your back because they love you and they care about you, right? Yeah. Mike, you spend a little bit of time watching my back? Absolutely. And you do the same. I watch my back too. <laughs> Nobody watches Mike's back. <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, there's a reason I rail against exploitation, uh, particularly of people you work with. But uh, Food. But no, we do that, right? Like we're constantly reminding each other about had, you know, people we like, people we don't like, you contact me about people who are dangerous or crazy or whatever, and, oh, yeah. you know, we, we watch each other's back, right? Absolutely. What yeah. else are friends for? It's called a tortoise formation, apparently, this Roman thing. you think it would have taken them a lot longer to make an empire going at that speed, but maybe he means something else. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, does, does your dad, is he proactively watching your back? Not at all. Right. Not at all. Right. Yeah, and if you want to achieve anything other than the mediocre, you need people to watch your back. You just, you do. You need people to watch your back because there's dangerous people out there. And um, if you don't have people around you who are watching your back, you're going to get bullied and exploited because you, you, you just, you can't do the whole job of a tribe yourself. You're right.